that is a joint presentation. <clears throat> and we will be on time, right, Jennifer? We are going to be on time. We're going to set the stage for the, uh, for the whole uh, balance of the morning. Uh, so what we're going to be doing is talking about two, two cases. They're important cases because they came out from the Supreme Court of Canada, and they came out within 16 days of each other. They came out this year, and they both deal with religious organizations. It doesn't come much better than that for lawyers that like to follow case law. Uh, Supreme Court of Canada is the highest court in the land, and uh, unlike uh, the provincial government, you can't just have a notwithstanding clause. We have to abide by what the Supreme Court of Canada has to say. So what Jennifer and I are going to do is talk about the two decisions. One is dealing with the Highwood con Congregation to Women's Witness that came out in, uh, in uh, uh, May the 31st of this uh, year, and then we're going to be talking about the Trinity Western decision uh, that came out on June the 15th. We are not going to be talking about the underlying issues uh, that, that are there. We're going to be just listening to what the Supreme Court of Canada has to say and learning from that. Otherwise, we have a whole day session dealing with freedom of religion, and, and that's not the purpose of our presentation this morning. So I'm going to be dealing with the, uh, the Highwood Congregation uh, decision, uh, the Wall decision, which is otherwise known as, and uh, tell you a little bit about that, give you some sort of context for it, and then Jennifer will deal with the uh, Trinity Western decision. Jennifer, you, you had my permission at 1147, if I'm not finished by then, you can give me the hook like I'm giving everyone else, uh, so that we stay, uh, stay on time together. The, the decision involving Mr. Wall uh, dealt with a congregation out in Calgary, the only witness congregation, very small, 100 members, um, was not incorporated, did not have a constitution, did not own property, did not have employees, <clears throat> very, very small. Uh, and uh, because of a situation involving Mr. Wall, uh, they went through the process of disciplining him, disfellowshipping him, because of his uh, conduct, and, and as a result of that, um, uh, he, wasn't, uh, he wasn't happy about the end result. Uh, he was uh, shunned and felt that his property and civil rights were impacted because uh, he was not able to connect with other members of the Jehovah's Witness congregation. He was a real estate agent uh, and felt that uh, his ability to earn a living, uh, property rights were being impacted because of that. Uh, he appealed it within the Jehovah's Witness context to the appeals to the process that they had, right up to the uh, to the Watchtower and Bible Tract Society of Canada. So he went through that whole process of trying to have the matter dealt with because he wasn't happy with the uh, particular uh, decision that was made about him. So he made an application through his lawyers for judicial review. A judicial review. Uh, is a, a type of process that's seeking assistance from the court that is very specific and full of all sorts of different requirements that are associated with it. His position was in judicial review that his property civil rights were impacted uh, because uh, the process of disciplining him, uh, in his opinion, did not follow the principles of natural justice. And so it went to the uh, uh, the Alberta Court of, uh, Court of Queen's Bench, and then it went to the Alberta uh, Court of Appeal, uh, and then to the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, at the uh, Alberta Court of Appeal, uh, he alleged that there had been failure to follow principles of natural justice uh, because he wasn't aware of the allegations of men, uh, against him. He alleged that he wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't explained to him the process, he wasn't given an opportunity to have legal counsel, he alleged that he didn't have written reasons, and uh, uh, as a result, he felt that uh, his uh, rights were compromised. So, so that was the background. The Court of Appeal that in Alberta uh, had determined uh, that this was a matter that the courts could review, uh, that it was subject to judicial review. And as a result, the Supreme Court of Canada had to look at a very narrow issue very narrow issue is simply uh, whether or not, uh, if ever, courts have the jurisdiction to review the decisions of uh, religious organizations when there are concerns about procedural fairness. 
That's it. Right? That's, that's all the Supreme Court of Canada uh, were talking about. And as a result, the nine judges of the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously determined that no, the courts did not have jurisdiction to exercise judicial review uh, over the decisions that had been made, uh, the decisions that had been made by the congregation in, in Calgary. They gave their reasons based upon three different, uh, uh, three different reasons for it. The first of all, uh, they said that the judicial review is a matter of a public law. It deals with uh, a type of legal review for state actors uh, and was not applicable to a congregation. And it also had to be uh, referenced by being of a sufficient public nature uh, for, the, uh, for the courts to be able to exercise judicial review. Not surprisingly, the, the Supreme Court of Canada said a congregation that didn't have any type of uh, a constitution associated with it uh, was not a state actor. Right? So, so that was an important principle. Not really new law, mind you, but there had been some confusion concerning whether or not there could be a judicial review. Uh, the, the second uh, thing that the Supreme Court of Canada, or reason that they gave uh, for their decision, was again, remember that the basis for the application was based on uh, that there was uh, not sufficient uh, principles of natural justice to be followed. And, and so the, the court, uh, Supreme Court of Canada said that there's, that there's not a sort of a, a basic um, right, a freestanding right, to procedural fairness, uh, natural justice, unless there are legal rights, fundamental legal rights that are being impacted. So this was clarity that the court uh, was providing, and, and I think in, in this situation it, it helped to make it quite clear uh, that the extent of the court's uh, involvement in reviewing decisions uh, would not be based simply upon breach of natural justice. Instead, there had to be more fundamental rights uh, that would be impacted before the courts would become involved. What would be those rights? They would be matters dealing with a contract or property uh, or matters dealing with employment. And so the Supreme Court of Canada gave a number of different examples associated with it. And in doing that, what they did is they, they looked to see whether or not Mr. Wall's situation was one that his property rights were being impacted. And the Supreme Court of Canada made a determination that uh, although he's a real estate agent and had access before to clients within the congregation, there was no proprietary right or interest that he had uh, in the members of the congregation. So the fact that uh, he was uh, disfellowshipped and was no longer able to speak with them or they speak with, with him did not constitute a loss of property rights. And so there is no fundamental uh, right that was impacted uh, that would give rise to the court's ability to exercise uh, judicial review. And the courts also made it clear uh, that simply being a member of an organization does not provide itself rights that are uh, reviewable by the, by the courts. So that was an important uh, clarification. Again, this whole case is about clarification in, in the law, not so much that it's a new law in place. The third thing that the uh, court said in relation to the basis for its decision uh, was that there had to be a determination of whether or not uh, a decision uh, was just justiciable, new word, justiciable, or you want to say it together with me. When you go to a party and someone says, uh, isn't this a fantastic party, you just say, yes, it's just justiciable, instead of saying it's delicious. <laughs> justiciable, uh, it is a determination of whether or not a court can get involved in doing a review, and you have to look at the institutional capacity and the legitimacy to adjudicate a particular matter. And so the Supreme Court of Canada, not surprisingly, said in the decision that the court should not uh, be deciding matters of religious dogma. But they got that right, right? It's, it's not a good idea to do that. And, and the Supreme Court referenced an earlier decision that they had in the Anselm decision where they said, and we're quoting, secular judicial determinations of theological religious disputes or of contentious matters of religious doctrine 
I'm justifiably entangled in part in the affairs of religion. Do I hear an amen? Amen. They got it right. right. And that's a very important uh, development that, that is uh, taking place. And they also said that it even involves procedural rules, if procedural rules are based upon uh, matters of religious doctrine. And they were specifically making reference to Matthew 18, and some of you will know Matthew 18 talks about approaching a brother or sister who is going the wrong way, and what you need to do under in relation to New Testament uh, uh, procedures and the dogma in relation to bring that brother or sister back into the fold, so to speak. The court, Supreme Court of Canada, said <clears throat> even be trying to make that interpretation of how to do a Matthew 18 is a religious interpretation, and the courts don't want to deal with it. The, uh, the last thing that the Supreme Court of Canada had to say is when it comes to private organizations like churches, like volunteer organizations, the uh, Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms does not have application. The Charter has application in relation to a legislative executive and administrative branches of government. Uh, there are human rights legislation, codes that you have to be worried about, but from the standpoint of disputes that take place, the uh, Charter does not have application. But what are some of the, the takeaways that we, can, that we can take from this particular decision? <laughs> First of all, it's important because it provides clarification of the law and provides uh, a narrowness of what the court is prepared, or what the court is prepared to become involved. And that's important. But what the case does not provide is clarity of when they will become involved, it's when they won't become involved. That's all we can take from this particular decision. So the first thing is when we're looking at when the courts will not intervene uh, is the, the matter where uh, judicial review is being suggested. It doesn't apply to a church, a voluntary organization that has to involve a state actor, that has to involve sufficient element of a, of a public uh, issue. It isn't just because it impacts a lot of people. It has to have a particular uh, question of law that deals with administrative decision-making power. So that's, that's the first takeaway. Second takeaway uh, is that the, uh, the ability of the courts to become in, involved uh, in making determinations uh, will not include interpretation of religious uh, dogma, which is obviously a good thing. Uh, but when it comes to uh, that particular limitation, you have to put it in the context because the Supreme Court of Canada was clear that if there are contractual relationships already in place, and that can be reflected in the Constitution, uh, can be reflected in, in, in bylaw provisions, uh, then that does not preclude the court from being involved in those situations. Uh, and then third, and most importantly, uh, the uh, decision uh, of the Supreme Court of Canada uh, provides a clarity of when uh, a court will come in involved if there's allegations of breach of natural justice. And basically, there's not the right of intervention by the court in principles of natural justice unless there's underlying rights that are being impacted, property, employment, and, and civil rights, uh, tort matters. There has to be an underlying right before the courts will be to then intervene. But if you do have a procedure in place for your organization, and most of you probably do in your constitution, and you don't follow your constitution, then you're going to be in trouble. Okay, so this, this case is not saying that the courts will not intervene uh, if you fail to follow your own procedure. You must be following the procedure that you have in place. So the limitation of when the, the courts will uh, become involved is very fact specific. You cannot overly generalize saying well, the courts can't become involved. If you have a constitution, they will take a look at it. So what are some of the considerations from a corporate standpoint because the law decision involved a congregation that was unincorporated and did not have a constitution? <laughs> most of you here have constitutions. Most of you are incorporated. Under the Canada Not-for-Profit Corporations Act, and the new law NCA does provide a, a mechanism for uh, discipline of members, you have to set up the circumstances and the manner in which the discipline will take place. doesn't say it has to reflect principles of natural justice. You just have to be able to set that out. Uh, so that's statutory. And so if you're going to discipline someone and you're eventually incorporated, then you're going to have to 
do that in accordance with the bylaw requirements that you have, and also with regard.